Oh, hello there. Yes, well, the joys of Sunday, indeed. Anyway, today I'm going to have a longer video because I want to unpack uh, what the gorgeous pouting Rafe has said recently at the New Culture Forum's uh, annual conference about education. Um, not because it's purely tosh, and not because it's very nasty authoritarian tosh that doesn't realistically live in any form of reality that I can see, but because I think it really gives a very, very good, clear, insightful view of the thinking that comes out of Tufton Street. Let's not forget, hi, I'm Peter Whittle, and the rest of them are based at Tufton Street. So when we stare into the abyss that is this presentation, you get a really good idea of what they mean when they talk about free speech and liberalism. Yeah, doesn't mean what you think it does. But the most intriguing thing about this, and it's worthwhile staying for the end or jumping through if I'm too boring, is uh, the question that's asked at the end, which um, basically blows the whole presentation away because it asks the most pertinent question, which is, well, if young people aren't very invested in society, could it be that society isn't doing a lot for them? But I guess that's just too intellectual highbrow for a communist teacher like me. Anyway, do sit back, do enjoy. It's a bit of a hoot, really. At various times, I will pause and make comments. Do enjoy. <laughs> yes, I know. Disappointing. No bow tie. Whenever I see this guy, I always think to myself, you need to ask yourself the question why Tucker Carlson no longer wears a bow tie. It's because somebody who he couldn't ignore told him what an idiot he looks. Anyway, moving on. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm still allowed to say that, aren't I? Yes, I think so. Um, before I start, I just hope you'll all join with me in a special thanks to everyone's favourite mayor, Sadiq Khan, for not following his Belgian comrades and cancelling today. <laughs> um, those of you that have ever heard Conservative MPs or ministers speak will recognise the uh, initial joke, which is always at the expense in some way of some minority group. I remember... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Peter Bottomley, uh, one time I saw him back in the 80s, who made a very nasty misogynistic joke to warm up the crowd. And then, of course, you need the crowd pleasing stuff um, whereby uh, this was filmed a uh, few days after um, the NatCons uh, got in trouble for, um, well, hacking off some Belgians, really. Anyway, moving on. I mean, who would have thought Khan is not the worst mayor out there? It's quite remarkable. Um, although it is so quite early, so maybe I'm being premature with that, who knows? Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back here again for our fourth annual uh, New Culture Forum conference. And it's a conference that we always hold on St. George's Day. I'm a historian. I'm a, uh, <coughs> Legend has it that when England... Right. Um, Rafe isn't a historian. Rafe was involved with Burke's peerage, which means he basically collected birth certificates and shuffled them into order. He is always presented as a historian, but he's, he has produced no real works of history whatsoever. His one realistically published book is A Tourist Guide to London. England is in peril. We need simply strike Drake's drum in Buckland's Abbey, and the sound of the drum will bring Sir Francis back once again to save England as he did against the Armada in 1588. Take my drum to England, hang it by the shore, strike it when your powder's running low. If the dawn sight Devon, I'll quit the port of heaven and drum them up the channel as I drummed them long ago. <laughs> well, if there was ever a time to sound Drake's drum, I think we're coming pretty close to it <laughs> right now. Yes, anyway. um. Rafe likes to bang on about British heroes, but uh, Drake is a very, very controversial figure. Any cursory look at the history of the slave trade will include Drake's name as the kind of beginning of. Um, you can look this stuff up yourself. Um, 
You can either regard him as a British hero, which he is to a certain extent, but that very much comes from the sort of empire view of British history, which Rafe buys into, whereby there are very good people and they're very bad people. And the good people just simply are good and you mustn't criticise them. Anyway, we'll come back to him. But unfortunately, I would wager that there aren't many children today in school who know the legend of Drake Strum. And indeed, I doubt that there are many who actually even know who Sir Francis Drake is. Firstly, because, of course, he is one, another one, I should say, of our great British heroes who has been cancelled for villainy. And secondly, because our children today are leaving school hugely ignorant of our island story and with very little knowledge of uh, the country and the society that they live in. Right. Um, it would be very, very interesting to uh, draw a straw poll at uh, any of those little gatherings that you get in London with people wrapping themselves in the Union flag um, as to how many of them know who Sir Francis Drake was or indeed anything about him. People my age, um, basically boomers and above, uh, will do so. But that's because we were taught that at primary school. I don't recall being being taught anything about the British slave trade, however, at primary school. Let's move on. For example, did you know that the majority of British school children in this country cannot identify this gentleman as Britain's leader in World War II? In fact, a quarter of children believe Churchill is a fictional character like Sherlock Holmes. So with levels of... Right, okay, um, that's not actually true. He's quoting one very particular thing there. Um, fine, okay. Um, are there realistically an awful lot of adults, for example, leaving aside Churchill and perhaps one or two other figures, who could realistically, I don't know, think about any 20th century prime minister uh, pre Margaret Thatcher, how many how many adults today could recommend uh, could, could recognise Clem Attlee? Hmm. I would really doubt it. Anyway, moving on. Knowledge so shockingly no low. Is it any surprise, therefore, that so many young people have fallen for the ridiculous attacks and the false accusations made against Churchill and any number of historical figures? Because ultimately, if one is ignorant of history, one is far more likely to believe fake history or biased history. And yes, ind indeed, Rafe. Um, Rafe doesn't apply those rules to himself, of course, because he does live in a world where Churchill is just a great man. End of. Um, oh, Churchill was a real human being who existed in his own time and space, and as such, we must evaluate him on that basis but by all means don't evaluate him by the standards of today but even judging him by the standards of his day he was an extremely controversial figure um one has only to think about his application of force against communists in the uk to realize that his actions during the general strike et al moving on and i'm afraid our ignorant children are exposed to both they get fake history outside school and increasingly biased history in school. Consequently, I'm sure none of you are going to be surprised to find out that Britain's youngest generation is the most radically left wing in history. By almost every measure, a majority of young people today hold views that are completely out of kilter with every other age group. And we've never seen... Okay, um... I would dispute that. I think it's a horrendously simplistic thing to say. Um, think about different generational possibilities. Think about the youth of the 60s and the difference between them and the immediate post-war generation. That's pretty much of a change. Um, you think about uh, youth in the late 1930s, certainly, in terms of the obvious threat of Nazism might come back to authoritarianism no doubt but i mean that was a very radicalized youth because they were still very much in awe of what was going on in the soviet union so i'm not sure rafe but anyway in such a disparity before for the first time ever more young people favor a republic than a monarchy for example more young people believe britain is intolerant than believe it is tolerant and more are ashamed of this nation and its past than are proud. In other words, love of nation has been replaced by national self-loathing. 
And let me give you another example. What do you actually think is the biggest issue for British youth today? You would think climate change or Brexit. Racism. Can you believe it? Even though Britain consistently ranks amongst the top three least racist nations in the world, just behind Sweden and Brazil, according to young people, systemic racism is Britain's number one issue. And it right, OK. Um, an awful lot of what he was he's going to call young people there. I, I, I would be interested to see where he might point to an actual study I can look at, because you know how brutal I can be with those things. But if we think about an awful lot of people are under 18 today, an awful, awful, awful awful lot of them aren't necessarily what we might call indigenous white people or if they are they will know lots of people that aren't could that have something to do with it ray well he's likely to say no it's the teachers anyway moving on it's a strongly held belief which obviously has no basis in reality whatsoever Perhaps more worryingly than that is the fact that this generation that prides itself on its tolerance and liberalism is in fact, of course, the most intolerant and illiberal. For example, young people today believe protecting free speech is less important than stopping hate speech. And of course, as you can see in Scotland and in Ireland, hate speech is defined so broadly and so loosely that it will cover the conversations of the majority of this public. Definitely some of the speeches up here today, I would imagine. And of course, in Scotland. Right, OK. And, uh, you know, the notion of free speech here is something that Rafe uh, runs through what Rafe is going to say. And it's worthwhile sort of thinking about when he comes on to his uh, solution to the wrong thought of young people. And I use that phrase, I think, very precisely. Um, when he's arguing about free speech and allowing people to make up their own mind, because as you might be getting a sense to the, what I'm going to say about this, um, this is very, very much a, a, a world viewpoint that actually argues against its own rationale. Anyway, moving on. And criminalizing speech in your own homes now sets the scene for children in the future to report on their parents to the police for hate speech. It's a dystopian scenario, terrifyingly reminiscent of the Cultural Revolution of Chairman Mao. Yes, the Cultural Revolution of Chairman Mao, where young people were uh, encouraged to snitch on their elders. Uh, Rafe w will make similar, uh, <laughs> put out similar policy ideas in a few minutes' time, uh, in the sense that uh, parents that think the right things need to be involved in their school and kick up a right old fuss if there's a teacher that they don't like, in essence. Yes, you mustn't think the wrong things, or indeed say it. Hmm... And I can't emphasize how serious this is potentially in the future because we're bearing witness to a revolutionary, epoch defining almost shift in attitudes, values, beliefs, and worldview that run completely contrary to what every other generation has believed before. And if that. Well, again, I. I would strongly suggest that Rafe maybe looks at ABCA and the role it played, the Army Bureau of Current Affairs during the Second World War, which very, very much radicalised uh, or at least set a uh, generation of young people that uh, were fighting during the Second World War with the notion that the world can be changed and it can be made a better place. Um, I don't think Ralph will have heard of ABCA, but there we go. That trend continues in 20 or 30 years time, the overwhelming majority of the working age population of this country won't just be completely ignorant of this nation's culture and its history and its achievements, they'll actually despise this nation or at least be ashamed of it. And the achievements and the legacy and the values of all our previous generations of which we are the custodians will have been purged from memory and replaced by the new artificial myths we see being created all around us. We will have landed... Think about if Ralph, Rafe was speaking to a German audience about um, how glorious the German national past was, because you can easily make a, 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 a... You know, nation myths are always about our glorious past. But think about um, if he was suggesting to a German audience that it would be vital that they reclaim the legacy that they had in the 1930s with their great leaders and the great things that were done in those days. And, you know, the way that young people's minds were being poisoned against that great legacy. You would, um, you would undoubtedly 
think of a particular political viewpoint that the person was coming from. Anyway. ...in our own year zero. And ladies and gentlemen, there is no hyperbole in such a statement because the framework for this dystopian society is already being constructed all around us. And you can see it everywhere, particularly in our education system. In our schools and universities, we see it in the decolonization of whiteness, of Britishness, Eurocentric syllabuses and reading lists. We're seeing it in the promotion of gender ideology, critical race theory, in the removal of much-loved books from school libraries, in the rewriting of our history by such things like inserting ethnic groups into Britain's story hundreds of years before they actually arrived here, absurdly claiming that Britain was built by immigrants, we see it in the denial of Britain's achievements, such as Britain's pivotal role in ending the Atlantic slave trade. The list goes on. And well, yes, and it's a list of all the usual bunkum that people like this come out with. Um, I'm not quite sure that Rafe actually knows what's on the history curriculum for schools, because um, I could certainly puncture most of that stuff. Uh, the modern history curriculum was written in, basically written by himself, uh, Michael Gove, in 2010 onwards. Um, I'm not quite sure if you can paint Michael Gove as a uh, radical leftist. I don't really know. Uh, maybe he is compared to Rafe. I doubt it. I mean, what you get here is just all of these, all of these, all of these notions that somehow, magically, because people don't know what goes on in schools and can't really be bothered to find out, like Rave, that they can be hoodwinked easily into believing that various things are being done when they're not. As I keep saying over and over and over again, there is no teaching of critical race theory in schools. If such a thing was to be true, if schools were teaching kids to be ashamed of their white skin, etc, 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 Ofsted would close them down because Ofsted is a branch of government charged with such things. But it's just easier to point at particular pictures or lines in a textbook of things you don't like as somehow magically symptomatic of all those other things that are supposedly going on. Anyway, moving. For those who lived under Chinese communist rule or behind the Iron Curtain, this will sound eerily and scarily familiar because the communists understood that to establish control over a society required the severing of the link between a people and their past. History would be rewritten, national pride and identity erased. And that's the most effective way of undermining, demoralizing and destabling a society. And the communists were masters of that tactic and young minds were their principal targets. Okay, and uh, surprisingly, he doesn't actually quote Adolf Hitler there, because that's the usual one. You know, Adolf Hitler, give me the child, I'll give you back the Nazi, etc. I mean, he doesn't allude to that, if you like. But this is the crux of what these people are on about. They are, at heart, very, very old-fashioned anti-communists. And what they're going to try and persuade you is that what the, the, the current place that the majority of the population are in, in society, is magically some tipping point into a communist future into a communist future um speaking to someone who is um often described as communist even though i'm not i can't see that i'm not really getting that at the moment after all if we think back to the last few uh, <laughs> the last few elections uh before they threw it away the conservatives at the last election under Boris Johnson had 80 seat majority so I'm not really quite sure how much of a tipping point we're at, Rafe. But never mind that now. If you stare under your bed for long enough, you can start to see red flags. But ideological subversion doesn't require the infiltration of our schools by foreign powers. Our children have been ideologically subverted by a teaching profession that is overwhelmingly left wing. And I'm not saying that all teachers are bad. Most teachers do a great job on a lousy salary. But the fact is, today, approximately 90% of teachers vote for left-wing parties. Right, and of course we go back to the to this basic problem, which Rafe and a lot of other people, now Rafe gets his head around it, he just can't be bothered to apply the logic to it. But um, yes, educated people are left-wing, because reality is left-wing. 
and all of those other phrases that come with that. If you have a good level of education, you will look critically at lots of things across the board, and you are likely to come up with uh, solutions to problems, if you like, which are to the left of people without such good education. That's been true throughout history, okay? Yeah? There was a particular reason why we read people like George Orwell. He had a very, very good education. Think about Bernard Russell, uh, uh, Bertrand Russell and the rest of them, yeah? You know, I mean, think about all those great modern British historians like Thompson and Hobsbawm, yeah? These were incredibly well-educated people. Maybe having been that ed well-educated and, you know, reading a whole bunch of stuff, that's why they came up with the left-wing viewpoints that they do. But according to Rafe, it's, it's actually sp something of a plot that educated people are left-wing. How? Well, they're taught by educated people who are left-wing. Yeah, so they don't get to make their own mind up. No, 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 they don't. Because because magically, and he's trying to sort of pretend that this has somehow happened in the last 20 years, what happens is that as people become more educated, they become more indoctrinated and less able to think for themselves. That's the only inherent logic that I can come to with what Rafe is saying. It's a totally nonsensical thing to argue. The majority of the British public who aren't very well educated are prepared to accept the sort of tosh that this man is spouting. Because they don't have the critical facilities. Not like Rafe. He's brilliant. And that's a world away from when we were at school, when there was much more of an equal balance, if not a slight leaning towards the right. Children absorb their teachers' beliefs and views and attitudes as if by osmosis. So it's yes, there you go. You see? So it wouldn't really matter if you have this whole teaching profession that are all left-wing. It wouldn't really matter what's on the curriculum. He's basically what he's arguing. Because magically I can influence people by the same process that water goes into plant roots. Or something like that and the beauty of that position is of course that you can't really argue against it it means that if you set up a camera on me um, when i'm when i'm teaching which actually happens actually because most of my online stuff is actually recorded you'd be able to pick out things you don't like and claim that i'm indoctrinating young people if you fancied that would be the case but life isn't realistically like that and i have i've consistently said uh, on this channel in videos that as far as I'm aware I have never ever persuaded a single young person to accept the same worldview as me they come with that to me yeah no matter how old they are be they 8 or 13 or 19 they come with that worldview and I might well fill in some of the gaps for them in terms of of, of, of what they're thinking but they certainly don't magically think that the joining the British Communist Party is an idea because I've given them a history lesson. Life isn't like that. It's no surprise, therefore, that at the next general election, only 7% of 18 to 24 year olds have said that they're going to vote for the Conservative or a right wing party. Right, yes. There may be another reason for that, Rafe. Could it be like the guy's going to ask at the end, that there are other things happening. Maybe. Let's move on. The rise of left-wing youth mirrors the rise of left-wing teachers and the teaching establishment. And we have seen plenty of evidence of some teachers increasingly bringing their politics into the classroom. Children have reported being taught that Britain is structurally racist, hearing about patriarchy, or being encouraged to self-identify as trans without their parents' knowledge. Right, okay then. Um, I'm not really... I mean, I mean, okay, you can argue all of that stuff about trans. If you don't like trans people, then teachers are making kids trans. But I'm not really quite sure is hearing about patriarchy. Um, I personally, as a sociology teacher, don't really know how I could teach feminism without mentioning patriarchy it kind of comes with the territory i mean i could mention mary walsoncraft and maybe simone de beauvoir but i'd be a bit stumped when we got to the 60s really wouldn't i still never mind that now i think rafe doesn't want me to teach sociology not just me but sociology as a whole 
and the significance of this left-wing indoctrination in our schools can't be overestimated. At the next election, millennials and Gen Z will cast more votes than baby boomers for the first time. Meanwhile, conservative voters are dying at a rate of 2% per year. Thousands of right-wing voters die each and every day, and they are clearly not being replenished. Uh oh, dear. So there's now a deficit of old right-wing voters. Yeah, I know, I'm smiling too. Anyway. As a result, the votes of this young left-wing demographic will soon become crucial to British politics. Now, some might say, oh, yes, but, you know, once they get older, you know, kids always become more right-wing gradually with age. And they'll quote the old adage, if you're not a liberal at 25, you have no heart. If you're not a conservative at 35, you'll have no brain. And that did indeed stand true for many generations, but no longer. For the first time since such records began, British youth, indeed British people under 35, aren't becoming more conservative as they age. And again, Rafe's belief, magically, is because someone like me has been teaching for 20 years, is the reason why young people aren't going to vote Conservative. And you will notice that for people setting themselves up as potentially a new political party, you will notice the emphasis on Conservative, because we have to have a Conservative government it would be very scary, especially to the people at Tufton Street, if that particular avenue to power was to go. Hmm. So what's the solution? Well, only radical reform of our education system can ensure that the youth of today and tomorrow receive a genuinely balanced education that's neither left-wing nor right-wing, but one that is founded upon fact and objective truth, and which is free from bias, from nihilism, and harmful ideology. Because make no mistake, we have no hope of winning the war on woke if we do not first win the battle for young minds. Right, okay then, there we go. Harmful, I noticed the phrase harmful ideology there. So other ideologies are non-harmful. What ideologies are non-harmful, Rafe? Well, anything that I think's okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, mate. And when I say young minds, I'm talking about primary and secondary school level, because far too often the focus is always on universities. But the battle for young minds must start much earlier in a child's life mm -hmm. to have true success. Just remember Aristotle's oft-quoted adage, give me a child of seven and I will show you the man. Once they're at university, it's already too late. As I like to say, if the hair is blue, there's nothing you can do. <laughs> yes, this is a man that wears bow ties. Just leave that one hanging. <laughs> now, <laughs> I, I probably need an hour to go through all of the reform policies that we need to do to dismantle the left stranglehold over education. So I can just give you a few key points here. But if you can get a hold of our new book, State of Emergency, I do detail things in much greater detail in my chapter there. But first of all, it's important to change the ethos in schools. Schools must be legally obliged to, ab to abide by certain core principles. These being, firstly, that no compelled speech, thought or belief must be taught. Children must be taught how to think, not what to think. Okay, and, you know, this is a, 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 a standard view, which I'm, I often come up against as a teacher, because people will say to me, oh, you, you know, um, you, need to, you need to make children think for themselves. And I do. Uh, I will always give alternate views about things. I very often go through things like the news uh, with some of my older pupils, and I will give them uh, what is both a fair and balanced diagnosis of what's going on, if you like, and allow them to make up their own minds. Um, I, I do make it very clear to them that uh, balanced isn't necessarily fair. Um, I think it's it's balanced would be, well, the Conservatives have got a bit of a climb uh, to uh, win the next election. But fair is uh, their toast. The two things are different, and I think Rafe uh, can't really get his head around that. 
because he would see that as too nuanced, despite the fact that, you know, I work with bright young people that are taking GCSEs and A-levels. They're not, they're not vessels, they're not empty vessels. And yeah, as I say, people, people will say, oh, well, you know, you are telling them what to think. I'm not. All right, they will come to these thoughts all on their own. And very often, you will, you know, the, the, the argument as well is that if you give them materials which are magically do make them think, that somehow you shouldn't really do that until, I don't know, probably at university level is often the kind of thing that, that you end up with. You end up with this kind of nonsensical viewpoint that children must be protected from thoughts whilst at the same time being exposed to them. It just doesn't work. Related to that somewhat, the promotion of contested ideology must be banned, so no critical race theory or gender ideology being discussed in, in school, unless it is in, in, a, in a comparative situation, perhaps. Unless it is in a comparative situation, perhaps. No, I don't know, Rafe. Um, so in other words, we can talk about that, but we, it has to be policed in such a way as you'd be happy about the way that I presented those kind of things. Is that what that means? And, you know, this whole notion of contested ideologies is, <laughs> is always shorthand for things I don't like. Michael Gove used to do this. He used to, he used to, um, Back in the days when he was he was he was making huge cuts in things like FE, he would he would use the phrase about contested ideologies, like there was this two sides to a debate. And what he really meant was everyone is telling me this is a bad idea, but I don't agree with them. And that is a perfect, perfect way of approaching what Rafe is saying. In the senior years. Three, respect for dissent, individual, individuality and non-conformity, because opposing views must be taught to be respected. And the reality is, many pupils in schools don't feel that they can speak up with a contrary viewpoint for fear of being shouted down. And quite often it's only a vocal minority that holds those contentious views, but the majority feel cowed into silence. Right, OK, yeah, well, that's peer pressure. Um, as a sociology teacher, I could wax very lyrical about peer pressure. It works both ways, of course, yeah? Um, you know, this, I mean, you know, think about the standard belief that um, it's easy to come out as trans at school. And then think about peer pressure and how easy things are. Think back to your own childhood, no matter how old you are. And think how easy it was to be different from the kids around you. It's very, very very hard. Adults struggle with it very often as well. You know, we like a quirky individual, but at the same time it takes a long time to make one, and schools aren't very good at doing so. Five pupils from the ages of 10 to 16 should take part every year in compulsory debates in which each pupil argues from a position they would otherwise oppose. That will enable them to learn the art of respectful argument. They'll be able to handle being challenged and better appreciate the validity of opposing views, not requiring safe spaces and not thinking anyone with an opposing view is evil. Right, OK. Um, such things used to happen in schools. Um, I originally trained as a citizenship teacher and you know very often part of that curriculum as such when it existed um was such things um lots of young young people take part in debates um a half decent teacher will probably manage to put quite a few of those th types of things into history lessons etc but rafe doesn't really care about that that's not what he means he means the old-fashioned kind of 1950s oxford union style of thing which is which is fine granted but um I'm, I'm, the value of that is debatable because in essence decent schools will do it already and schools that don't feel they have the time won't anyway let's move on six in secondary schools pupils must be taught the dangers arising from the loss of fundamental freedoms such as free speech this should be taught with examples from history and literature, including, for example, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. And except in rare cases, third party providers will no longer be permitted to provide classes or teaching materials to schools. Okay, and yes, okay. Um, 
you notice the emphasis there on the Soviet Union. It's all about anti-communism. Yeah, but I mean... Anyway, but yeah, I'm, 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 let's move on. But that whole thing about third party providers, I, I don't know how on earth you could possibly police that. You would have to effectively have government approved uh, publishers of materials. Think about that in terms of your free speech and your freedom and everything else being government approved. Mm, I wonder what the Soviet Union would think about that, Rafe. Because they <laughs> Because there have been far too many examples of outside organisations providing inappropriate instruction, to put it mildly, to children without the knowledge or consent of parents. And parents are being denied the opportunity even to see these materials due to alleged intellectual property. In this digital era, of course, the Department of Education should quite easily be able to have on its own main website, you know, thousands of course sheets on all, every subject imaginable for any school to just go to and download, and download. There's no excuse in the age of the internet not to have those materials on a government website. Yes, um, but the government didn't want that to happen because they wanted third party providers to be able to charge schools for things. That's the reason, Rafe, okay? It was because they wanted to make a profit from the education of children. And now you're suggesting that we need a government-approved stamp on things. Hmm, I wonder who those contracts are going to go to. I bet it'll be the friends of some of the boys at Tufton Street. No staff member may promote active politicians, political parties, or other controversial bodies or organisations like Black Lives Matter. White privilege... Right, okay. Um, think about how broad, potentially, a definition of promote would be. I, I, don't make any, uh, I don't make any secret of my politics on the videos that I do. Um, but um, none, of my, none of my young people have ever seen any of my videos. Uh, it's one of the reasons I don't use my own name, for example. Yeah? Um, what you're basically saying there is um, you're going to want people effectively to sign up to not taking part in public life when they're teachers. And that's okay, but you would have to in some way reward them otherwise in terms of citizenship activities. I think that my ability to um, be active in my community, which at various times I am, uh, is an important part of what I do as a human being, and it's an important part of the kind of role model of things that I might show to young people. But what Rafe is worried about, of course, is that I have the wrong views that I bring forwards to that. Hmm. I mean, we could just have party members who are teachers, but that might perhaps just wreak a little bit of Nazi Germany. White supremacy, white fragility, these are racist terms, and anyone found using them in an educational setting, be it on school property or online, must face disciplinary proceedings. And the same goes for things like patriarchy and toxic masculinity. And again, patriarchy. What is it with the word patriarchy? It's patriarchy, come on, um, <laughs> that Rafe has so many problems with. Well, it becomes, because it comes with a whole ideological set of baggage that he seeks to re reject. That's what that is. He's actually terrified of the word. And he is seeking a safe space for his ideas. If you want to kind of have a dig at him from his own viewpoint. No school should be permitted to decolonize its syllabuses, library collections and so forth. And then we go on and on. So having changed the ethos of schools, it's then necessary to create a curriculum that unapologetically celebrates the genius and achievements of British and Western civilization. Not as propaganda or in a jingoistic way, but simply as fact. Chief amongst these reforms must be the teaching of history, for arguably no subject is of greater importance in the battle for the hearts and minds of our youth. A traditional history education is the best means of instilling a sense of pride, of belonging, and of place and identity in the young. It endows pupils with the knowledge to understand our nation and value our culture, our institutions, and our society. You simply cannot be an informed and engaged citizen of today if you don't understand how the world around you came to be. 
I, mean, I would wholeheartedly agree with him about that. But think about if you're a third generation or fourth generation Afro-Caribbean youth in this country. It doesn't take long before you start to ask some interesting questions as to how it was that the people of the Carib, uh, hence the name, no longer realistically exist in that part of the world and how it was that black African people ended up there and quite what was going on. Or, you know, think about anything in terms of vaguely modernist history, it becomes intensely problematic. I mean, there is a, uh, there's a section of, 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 on the um, GCSE syllabus which is about the spread of British democracy. It's called Power and the People, I believe, from AQA. And, you know, that, that, that has exactly what Rafe says in terms of um, it goes back to Magna Carta and takes in the Peasants' Revolts and various other supposedly markers on the way towards democracy. But one of the things about teaching that unit, as I've done a number of times, is that it raises a lot of questions with young people because they get to realise that we don't realistically haven't lived in a democracy for anything longer than about a hundred years. It automatically raises those questions of being questioning and therefore we therefore do have to question the past because if we hold up the Magna Carta as this beautiful document that was so important then why is it these days that we don't even have jury trials? Those questions have to be answered and you can only do so by a deeper deeper knowledge of British history like well-read people like me have because as a teacher of 20 years experience hell of a lot of info in my head. Anyway, moving on. Most importantly, a proper grounding in history makes it less likely that people will believe spurious and corrosive claims about Britain's past, because they'll be equipped with the knowledge to identify fake history and identify bad actors. Yes, indeed. And you'll notice all of those people that don't actually have knowledge of Britain's history, who will dress up as, well, some sort of faux crusaders and drape themselves in a flag. These people have no knowledge of British history because that's not what people used to do in the past. Yeah, think about, think about all the glories of British history. Absolutely. That we should be celebrating and an awful lot of them are to do with just things that Rafe would find quite distasteful. Right? Yeah, I mean, even the Magna Carta itself, think about that. Think about the Charter of the Forest, which is something that is never discussed uh, when we talk about the Magna Carta, which enshrined the commons for the people. That was lost um, with the Enclosure Acts, which happened all across the world, starting with Scotland and uh, Ireland and then uh, moving on uh, to the Americas. Yeah, that was a huge loss for people. It's a history that is never, ever going to be taught in British schools because again it raises too many problematic questions and Rafe can't dismiss that as not being factual because it sure as hell is. Now shamefully whilst history in most European countries continues to the age of around 15 or 16 in this country you can stop learning it at 14 and it's yeah, you, you notice he has to sort of like try and make that sound like huge. Yeah, they get a whole extra year or two. Um, yes, you have to choose it at 14. We can change it if you want, Rafe. You can add this, but it'll just end up as being a bit of a side on added thing because there isn't enough time in the national curriculum at present. <laughs> because the government has dictated it, this government, you know, the astonishingly left-wing one that has been uh, <laughs> set up by Michael Gove et al. Yeah, there isn't enough time to do this, Rafe, and it will end up just being a fudge. You know it, and I know it, but you can just, if you want, pretend that it might work. Leading on to the inevitable next few steps. Teach a child the broad sweep of British and European history in such a short period of time is simply impossible. And it's made even more difficult because the national curriculum also requires children to learn about non-European cultures. And so alongside British history, our children will be taught about 10th century Islamic civilizations, Mayan civilization, the West African Kingdom of Benin. And to do that within such a short period of time is completely unacceptable. So we at the New Culture Forum believe that history must be compulsory until the age of 16. 
The primary focus of the history curriculum must be on British and European history. Um, and if you look at the national curriculum, it is. Again, it was redesigned in 2010 under Michael Gove. And children must know that Britain is a product of Western civilization. No. Yes, yes, the magical West. Um, I don't think realistic. I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I, I don't know. You could somehow make that explicit, but I don't think it needs to be made explicit <laughs> to young people. I think they're quite, they're quite capable of understanding vaguely what the West is, uh, in a way that all those people that talk about the Third World don't aspects of postmodernism must be allowed in a school setting history must only be taught using traditional methods rooted in the quest for truth right okay notice the way he's put postmodernist in there what he means by that of course is this standard tufton street view of the world which is whereby um about 40 years ago uh, a bunch of communists uh landed uh in america and um they'd read gramsci and uh, they plotted to overthrow western that word again civilization by getting at kids by making all the teachers come together and agree to teach the kids that white people are bad roughly speaking that's what he's talking about postmodernism there and again I'd, I'd find it impossible to teach um a level sociology without concepts of postmodernism not in the sense that he means it but across the board um it's a widely recognized kind of a level style view that you might approach the world with um rafe doesn't know that never mind objectivity and the scientific method okay uh what rafe means by that is uh very much that you will learn about the history of kings and queens uh that dates and people are important and that's fine you can teach that but you don't teach people why things happen okay um i could teach you if you wanted me to i could do a video about winston churchill and give you loads of dates and facts and figures and people but that wouldn't explain to you why it was that churchill was vitally important to the nation in 1940 and didn't win the 1945 may 1945 general election that, to me, is the history you need to know. And all subjects must be taught in a fair, balanced and accurate manner, such as slavery and the British Empire. Teaching false or misleading history, or using materials that contain false, contentious or misleading information, must be prohibited. And this is one of the biggest problems of our time. You know, once trusted sources like the BBC produce things like horrible histories, which claims that black Africans played an active role in Britain for millennia. There was a children's book, Brilliant Black British History, that falsely claimed that black Africans built Stonehenge. And uh, The Guardian produced material for British schools in which it claims that, you have to, you have to laugh at this stuff, don't you? I mean, uh, The Guardian produced material that British, for British schools in which they claim that various historical figures were black Africans when they clearly weren't. From Magna Carta to women's suffrage, the history of Britain's long journey to democracy must be taught so that pupils gain a proper understanding of the hard struggle that led to the democratic rights we enjoy today and well, why we mustn't be so cavalier in getting rid of them. Yes, indeed. Notice the phrase, he used the phrase cavalier there, and I would wholeheartedly agree with that. But I would argue that the way that I teach those things, certainly within sociology and that particular AQA unit, would um, probably make Rafe lose his hair. Because I think I am teaching the reality of this. Right? Yeah? Rafe wants a history whereby good white people decided one day that something was unfair and therefore changed it that uh, <laughs> slavery was ended because some bloke went to the House of Commons one day and, and said, you know what, I've been thinking about it, right? I think that slavery is all wrong. And they all went in the House of Commons, they all went, oh, God, yeah, I hadn't thought about that, and banned it. And then they went around the world telling the other people who weren't as sensible and as intelligent as us that it was wrong. And they eventually came around to our point of view because that's the way that you get rid of autocratic things and replace them with democracy yeah it isn't that women chain themselves to railings set off bombs or indeed go on hunger strike that 
isn't the history that Rafe wants. We don't talk about the patriarchy, we talk about respectable middle class women and ignore the real history of, of them. Yeah, the Pankhursts of this world were socialists, Rafe. They were socialists, mate. Anyway. And the ascendancy, the rise and ascendancy of Western civilization should be a key theme of the history curriculum because few children today are aware of the exceptional and remarkable story of the West's rise to global dominance over the past five centuries. Western ascendancy should be taught in a factual and balanced manner, but no effort should be made to diminish or downplay the history, achievements and genius of our civilization or draw red comparisons with other civilizations on an equal footing. No, you see the way that that works, okay? So, you know, um, we could teach about the development of agriculture, but it pales into insignificance from um, the hovercraft of the late 1960s. Or we could talk, teach about, um, you know, the reason why we still have 60 minutes in an hour and uh, and 12 hours, uh, and, uh, uh, 24 hours, 12, made up of two lots of 12 hours, which comes from the Babylonians from thousands of years ago. But that isn't the same, for example, as uh, the steam engine. All of these things are patently farcical from anybody who has a reasonable understanding of history. But again, Rafe doesn't have that understanding of history because he is very much... Uh, has his nose stuck still in the 1936 Empire Book for Boys, which will show pictures of happy Malaysian rubber uh, plantation workers who really enjoy uh, the fact that um, their economy is controlled from London. Because, after all, they don't make any... Nobody makes any money out of that, yeah? If you look at the figures for... That's one, one of the things that Aaron Bastani and Navarra Media forever goes on about. Um, if you look at the figures for industrial production in India, it was completely decimated when it was part of the British Empire because India was there to be a market for British goods. We were not going to be a market for Indian goods. And again, think about all of that, all those lies, basically, that you're told about the importance of free trade. That's not what built the empire. Definitely not. That was British industrial might backed up by, well, gunboats of the Royal Navy. That's basically the last five millennia of history, if you want to be brutal about it. And of course, Rafe would take great exception about that because it's a bit messy when we talk about those kind of things. But those, that kind of application of power, we can see over and over again. Think about, again, the history of Ireland. If you talk to people in Ireland about their view of the greatness of the British and, um, <laughs> and Empire, I'm sure they would have a slightly contrary position. Let's move on. There must be a statutory requirement for pupils to be taught all of these following subjects, which I won't go through, but except to say that, of course, in school, we always have children now being taught about the horrors of Nazism, but never the horrors of communism. And we must Right. Um, no, lots of things in schools teach about the horrors of communism. Uh, if you do history at uh, uh, GCSE, uh, one of the units you're likely to take will be the Russian Revolution, for example, and uh, Stalin. Um, I often have words to say about Stalin. Um, he was a brutal monster that killed millions of people. There you go. That wasn't hard, was it? Uh, various others of those units will also teach you more stuff about, about for example, the Cold War, or as communism, and indeed stuff about um, Afghanistan and other places like that. Um, which also teach you the horrors of autocratic regimes. Autocratic regimes. You know, those regimes that dictate to their people what they should think about. Anyway, let's move on. You must ensure that, that that is rectified. Black History Month and Pride History Month should be banned from classrooms and replaced with an annual British History Week. We don't want schools celebrating our differences. We must celebrate the things that unite us. And during British History Week, pupils in each year would embark on different projects and celebrate great British figures, events, achievements, discoveries and inventions. And all schools must fly a Union flag and display a portrait of the King. The national anthem should be sung at the start of each day. Now, I would... Right then, okay, and uh, okay, if you want, um, 
There is no evidence whatsoever that anyone becomes more patriotic seeing a Union Jack or a picture of the king or sing, singing the national anthem. It's utter, utter performative farcical nonsense. And what I will always say to these people is, well, go on then, mate. First of all, you do it at the beginning of your working day, but uh, what I want for now is for you to sing me the second verse of the National Anthem, seeing as you like it so much, because nobody can. I always get some moans when I say that, but, you know, Catherine Babel sings, Michaela's school does it every day in Canada. Yeah, because if you recall, she doesn't want divisive stuff in her school. I'll leave you to ponder that one. I'll leave you to ponder that. Standard practice uh, every day. I don't see why it can't be here because national symbols are important and they are a way to demonstrate national identity and our shared allegiance. <laughs> now, curriculum reform is only part of the solution to our crisis because meaningful change is impossible without an influx of conservative teachers to address education's left-wing imbalance. To attract conservatives back into the teaching profession, new routes of entry need to be established from conservative-friendly fields such as business and the military. Now, the government already has a Troops for, to Teachers programme which pays for soldiers to be retrained as teachers. And that right, OK, and just to dive in there, yeah, it's been an absolute farcical, very expensive, abject, uh, uh, abject failure. Um, people often will say, well, we need we need we need ex coppers or, or soldiers because they understand discipline. Um, you don't need to understand discipline to get on well with young people. If you try and discipline young people, they will kick your teeth in metaphorically or otherwise. Um, I tend to work with young people and I try and show them respect and I expect respect backwards. I don't put up with snotty little idiots being snotty little idiots with me and I let them know that I can be enormously assertive in the way that most squaddies or ex-coppers that I've met in the classroom can't be because that's about character it's not about what your background is and some post-traumatic stress disordered Afghanistan veteran isn't necessarily going to perform well in a classroom, which is why they haven't been able to recruit people to it. It's been a farcical notion, and for the last 40 years, it's one of those things that always comes up because people that don't know what on earth they're talking about thinks it sounds like a good idea. Jordan Peterson wants you to make your bed. Why? And the answer is, he thinks that that will somehow instill discipline in you. It'll just make your bed be full of things that make you sneeze, I'm afraid. That programme should be developed and expanded as it will bring discipline directly into classrooms and provide pupils with authoritative authority figures who are also role models to look up to. And attracting experienced talent from the corporate world will finally allow conservatives the ability to enter the management and administrative structures of schools and departments. Right, OK, um, if you think about the academization program, which has been going on for decades now, that was uh, the idea with that was that there would be a partnership between businesses and schools. It just led to schools having to be run as businesses, and um, we can see how well that has worked out in terms of things falling apart. Um, again, just a totally spurious notion. Um, there are various government schemes like Teach First, uh, which are supposed to attract um, high potential high flyers from business into teaching before they go on to run ICI or whatever it might be. Um, the government has decided to close it down because it's expensive. Just leave that one hanging as it is, because it's always about the amount of money that they want to spend. There's no money going into schools, which is why various classrooms are taped off these days, because the roof might fall in on the kids. You may recall this from the last time the Conservatives were in power. It's getting to look a bit like uh, a sort of habitual thing that they do. But you're not going to magically change things by turning schools into businesses. They already are, Rafe. Because hitherto, the left have been far more successful than the right in gaining control of the institutional levers of power. 
And again, that's that nod to that long march through the institutions, which I'm, I am part of. Um, it's a good job I attended that meeting those 40 odd years ago, because um, I'd be really lost otherwise. But no attempt to break the left stranglehold over the teaching profession can succeed without tackling the teacher training institutions. Teacher training institutions are the root cause of many of the problems outlined today in my speech. Now, it wasn't always so. When they were small, independent colleges, these institutions performed relatively well. However, almost all of these colleges were closed down or taken over by universities. And today, most teachers are graduates of university education departments. Right. No, they're not, Rafe. Um, that simply is farcically, laughably untrue. Um, what Rafe seems to be arguing here is that we shouldn't have teachers that are graduates. That's the only logical thing. And if he actually believes that, OK, but they're not. Um, I did a PGCE when I was, what, 35 or whenever it was. Um, most teachers these days, an awful lot of people that call themselves teachers, aren't actually as qualified as I am because the government removed the restriction, again, under Michael Gove, that you need to be a graduate to be a teacher. So I don't know, Rafe, it's it's I don't see how you'd get graduates into teaching without them being, well, graduates, really. Or as I call them, woke madrasas. And... <laughs> oh, right. If you don't understand that particular phrase, um, that's him having a kind of racist dig. Uh, that's a uh, school for imams. OK, um, that's why the audience laughs, because they understand what he means by that. It's about brown people. And these madrasas are indoctrinating a generation of teachers into radical left groupthink. Right, OK. Um, I did my teacher training in 2004 um, at Canterbury, Canterbury Christchurch. Um, it was for about nine months, uh, which, if you include the placements, I was actually in the classroom for maybe, I don't know, six weeks. Uh, isn't really any time for groupthink at that point. Um, I don't think you can ideologically get groupthink uh, with just people sitting people in classrooms for six weeks uh, over the course of a year. Um, if you want to see how in-depth my training was, um, the total amount of time that was spent on special needs education, which I do specialise in, was half a day. Uh, just so, you know, Rafe can believe whatever he wants, but it's pretty hard without the complex machinery and maybe drugs to actually brainwash people that quickly. So to stop the advance of radical progressivism in our schools, it is essential to end universities' involvement in teacher training. Instead, teachers should be offered on-the-job training, whereby teachers are trained in special training schools, much as doctors are trained in university teaching hospitals. And they are. Rafe, it's one of the routes into education. Never mind. This was first pro proposed by the Tories in 1992 and again in 2010, and it's a policy with huge potential. It would see the creation of national training schools across the nation run by some of the very best and most experienced head teachers in the country. Now, embarking on any of these reforms would inevitably lead to conflict with the unions, pursuing the entire trance will be regarded as a declaration of war. But I say, bring it on. It was... <clears throat> yes, Rafe. Uh, indeed, mate. If you want to fight with me, I don't mind. I would win. Um, I would, of course, though, bring a gun to a knife fight. Um, yeah, indeed. OK, then, fine. Um, you know, um, we can't realistically get what we want. So we'll just change the law, is what he's saying. Because, you know, that's always the sign of somebody who's on the right side of history, isn't it? It was said that David Cameron wanted to take on the National Union of Teachers as Thatcher had done with the National Union of Miners, but he never did. But it's a reckoning that's long overdue. The militant unions have been the progenitors and enablers of much of the woke ideology that dominates our education system. The National Education Union has even called for the national curriculum to be decolonized. But if attempts to bring more conservatives into education... Yes. Um, if ever you want to paint anybody as a bogeyman, you can simply uh, point to a minor thing that a union, for example, has done at one of their conferences. Um, 
I could just pick out almost anything that Rafe has pointed here. One of the reasons I'm not going through the whole thing is just to point out oh, on, on, on a broad level about how farcical this is. Can you imagine, right, OK, deciding, the government deciding that they're going to curtail almost entirely <coughs> the power of the two major teaching unions? You'd instantly get a strike. That's what you'd get. And at that point, you'd have to answer to the electorate. Because I don't want to shock Rafe, but an awful lot of actual people have children who are actually in school. And you can see all of the problems there were in and around COVID when that started to, uh, you know, hamper the economy. Yeah, you if teachers go on strike for two weeks, let's say, you would have an awful lot of problems on your hands, Rafe, seeing as you're bringing it on. Education are successful, unions will soon find the politics of their membership diluted. Now, parents are often overlooked, but they also have an important role to play in resisting the left's long march through education. By playing an active role in their child's school life, parents can collectively exert considerable influence over a school's direction. Any parent should have the right to remove their child from school if they object to content that is being taught or deem the manner in which it's being taught to be unacceptable. Well, they do, Rafe. Um, there's a huge homeschooling movement out there. An awful lot of it um, is very, very dodgy. You might want to talk about safeguarding issues in and around trans, trans stuff. But by God, nobody talks about safeguarding issues with all those kids that are stuck at home with ultra religious parents it's horrific still never mind a eh, rafe that's all about parental choice which is the important thing notice the way that the child isn't involved in this <laughs> anyway acceptable and conservative parents must also serve as school governors school governors aren't involved Okay, um, most schools are businesses these days and don't have parents parents sitting as governors it's not really a thing anymore, Rafe. Uh, Rafe doesn't know that, of course, because schools are businesses and private concerns. They're not going to have parents in. Um, you can sort of go down the kind of Ron DeSantis, Florida view of having extremely rabid right-wing parents, but we know what that leads to. It leads to libraries with no books in them because the librarians dare not put anything out that a parent might object to. Good idea. Involved in the running of a school, but they can hold head teachers to account. They can ask why schools are teaching contested ideologies. They can examine policies on gender and race and so forth that a school might wish to implement. Taken together, these reforms are perhaps our best hope of producing informed and engaged citizens of the future who appreciate the value of free speech, appreciate our history, our culture, our institutions, and our society and appreciate the dangers posed by cancel culture. Yes, so it's all about free speech, uh, even though we'll uh, make sure that there's a curriculum that doesn't have anything that we don't want on it. And it's all about freedom, even though we'll make sure that the people involved in delivering this stuff don't have any freedom of action or indeed thought. Okay, Rafe, good man. With some equilibrium restored to the teaching profession, young people will hopefully have a balanced and rounded education that enables them to think freely and critically. And liberated from radicalism, we can only hope that many of them will once again embrace liberal principles of freedom, tolerance and free speech, spreading themselves out across the political spectrum from left all the way to right, and in so doing, ensure a more balanced and stable and indeed hopeful future for us all. Well, yeah, I mean, why not just advocate having quotas of uh, people in terms of different political perspectives um, so that schools will be required to produce 1.7% um, uh, fascists each year? Um, and if there's a shortfall of uh, liberal centrists, they'll just have to, I don't know, shuffle some of the communists into it or something. You can see what tosh that is, okay? What well, everything that he's just said is diametrically opposed <laughs> to notions of freedom and choice and liberalism. Thank you so much.
ladies and gentlemen, uh, fantastic speech there from Rafe. Uh, I think we've got just time for one, uh, one question on this one. Uh, okay, here it comes. I do love this. And they've actually included it. I'm, I'm, I'm gobsmacked at this. Let's have a look. I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but this gentleman was first here. Yeah, this one. Just here. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Now. Hi, thanks. That's certainly a program I can get behind. But I'd, I'd like to ask about um, what, what the reasons why the young people today are so left wing. And, um, you know, I'm sure what you say is true that you know, the, the, they grow up in a very, you know, they, they swim in a left wing milieu. And, but I, th I think it may be a bit simplistic to say that this is all just entirely because they're just passive receivers of whatever they're taught by, by the system. I want, uh, um, my question is, you know, I think a lot of young people are looking around and they're seeing, well, you know, I can't get on the housing ladder, I'm saddled down by student debt. A lot of people can see that, you know, they're just not having the opportunities that their parents' generation had. There's this sense that the system is rigged against young people. If we, if we want young people to be less left-wing, how much can we... How, is there no role for just fixing the issues that are driving them away from the Conservative Party? Oh, absolutely. I agree with you 100%. I mean... Yeah. And there you have it, you see. I would argue the reason why young people these days are left-wing is because they look at the world and come to a sensible conclusion about it. But, of course, that would then mean changing the world. That would then mean changing the level or the form, at least, of capitalism in the UK. And, of course, Tufton Street isn't going to do that because Tufton Street is all about wealth extraction for its business holders. They're not interested in education, as George Carlin used to say. Yeah, it's people who are just, 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 are just well educated enough to, to operate the machinery and stupid enough not to ask questions. Anyway, let's hear the answer. I mean, I only have so much time to address, but I do go into that also in my chapter. I'm not saying that this is the only reason, but of course this is about education. But absolutely, you know, young people quite rightly feel and often say, capitalism has failed us. We can't get on the housing ladder. We don't have the pension schemes that our parents had. We don't have the career security our parents had. Uh, we can't, pro we can't you know, progress, progress in life the way that our, our parents could. So you can fully understand why they feel let down by this conservative in name only party, which is essentially a neoliberal party posing as a traditional conservative party. Its guide, its, its guide in mantra is free market extremism, as far as I'm concerned, as you can see through people like Liz Truss, rather than reverting to you know, traditional, as I would call it, high Tory values, which believe in the conservation, you know, the clues in the name, conservative and conservation, conserving communities, making sure that there are sufficient social networks, safety networks, and so forth. I mean, we know for a fact that the, the most people in this country lean to the right on social issues, but actually lean to the left on policy issues. So the SDP, for example, is quite close to that. And I, I've always wondered why in this country we've never created a sort of Gaullist party as you have in France, strong on defence and patriotism and the military and, all, and traditional values, but also believes very much in the welfare state and all of those sorts of things. So I absolutely agree with you. And of course, along with all of those things, you also have the long march through the other, the other institutions. So all of our cultural institutions, our museums and our galleries, they watch television, they watch Netflix. There is a constant diet from every, from every angle coming at them, which comes from a, from a left-wing angle. So they are in essentially in an echo chamber of, of not only of their own making, but indeed of all of the people that they encounter in their daily lives. Yes. Um, yes, you may have noticed the extreme left-wing bias of everything. Um, no, sorry, Rafe, doesn't doesn't really work out that way, does it? Um, almost everything that I see on social media is right wing. Um, I, I often find myself, I mean, you know, just doing these kind of videos on YouTube, you can see exactly the level of reach that I'm likely to get with anything that I have to say. Um, even very, very successful left wing channels like Navarro Media are tiny drops in the ocean, which again, <laughs> it completely negates everything he has to say. Yeah, he still lives in that world whereby if you put a book in a library with 4,000 books and that book is about gay issues, the children will go to the gay issue book and become gay. That's the world he lives in because it's easier than accepting that some people just are like that. Anyway, I think that's it. Thank you so much for coming to Yeah, thanks, Ray. Anyway...
Yes, um, let's see what you think. Uh, I don't know. Tell me I'm wrong. Go on. Tell me that what, that what I've said as an actual teacher is wrong and what Rafe said is right. Yeah, if you want people to think for themselves, then accept that they may not agree with you. But accept it. That's the thing. Don't come up with increasingly authoritarian ideas about simply removing vast <laughs> the rights of vast numbers of British workers because you haven't won the argument. Yeah, if you believe in the marketplace of ideas, then believe in the marketplace of ideas. But don't, don't fudge the issue. Anyway, there you go. Do have a lovely day. It's a long one if you've managed to make it this far. Uh, I don't know. Give yourself a reward.